Okay, well, I've got the umbilical hooked up to this. I've got the receiver sitting over here. And, um, I have to move those over in a minute. I did replace the cord going to this. Obviously, it's not vintage cord. I may have to see what I can do. Uh, I know they sell it. But, um, the other thing uh, was this, the switch was definitely not working. So, um, what I did, let me just show you. Because, you know, I thought about refilming it, but I just thought, you know, I don't know. So, but I'll just quickly tell you what I did. There, there's a, two rivets here that hold this together. So what I did was I used, as I mentioned what I, I used this old, these old cutters for, and it worked. Uh, where'd you go? All right, up here. Um, so I used these cutters, and I carefully, and I carefully worked my way around them to fold the edge up, and then I throw them out. And this, uh, I'll tell you what, it's made very well. I mean, it's very good quality. Um, so, and then when I put it back together, I took a small nail and hit it several, hit it several times here to expand this. And it seems to be holding up quite nicely. So, um, <clears throat> when I took this apart, there's a little roller that uh, is moved forward and back by this control. And there's two contacts here that that roller comes uh, and ri rides against. And when I took it apart, the little roller, it looks like a little barbell, uh, actually. There's a skinny part that rides over the top of this inside. I cleaned it up with um, steel wool. And then I noticed inside here the control, the uh, these, these two contacts actually come right out of the big light case. So I was looking at those, and they were all black, and they were all, uh, and there's old grease in there, and so on. So I thought, well, what am I going to do with those? Well, just on a whim, um, I decided to, well, let me just show you. These are two, I bought the greaser because uh, because it said low fume, and I like that part, but it's not it's not the best degreaser that I've used. Um, I use it, but um, it's okay. I bought this because um, it says leaves no residue, and when you're working on contacts that are in um, those fiberboard, fiberboard things, um, rotary switches, they have a, a fiber ring and then they have the contacts secured in the fiber ring, plate, whatever it is. If you have residue left behind by your cleaner, there's a possibility that you could have arcing, you could have things arcing out. So I bought this because I want to be able to clean things without having to leave any residue behind, which would be safer, whether it's on uh, tube sockets or rotary switches or anything like that, circuit board, whatever. And I found out that this actually works pretty good as a uh, as a degreaser, but I was kind of shocked by how well it, it worked on this. So I shot gave a couple shots of this at, at one of the contacts and I saw it go from black to clean. I said, what? They did a really nice job. It took cleaned all the old grease out, uh, cleaned up the contacts beautifully. I also hit the little barbell in there with this and it cleaned it up even better than my steel wool did. So I'm really pleased. So this switch is it's probably going to last for as long the radio, as, as the radio does because the contacts in there are pretty healthy. So, um, 
So it is possible to save these. I've got one in my Atwater Kent that I did not take apart. Um, I just swapped things around in there. And I actually now have a, a, a replacement for that Atwater Kent, which I have not done anything with. I might try to repair the switch that's in the water, Atwater Kent and uh, see how well I do with that. Um, this switch was dead. It was not working at all. So I wasn't going to lose anything by taking it apart, so I decided to do that. And I think I may have some other switches floating around that I could use if this choose decided to not work, but it's beautiful. Tested it with my meter. There's no, you know, you could move the contacts. Uh, you could wiggle the knob, and the connection stays, stays solid. It doesn't, it doesn't do anything bad. So, very happy with that. So, all right. So here's what I've done. Well, let me just show you uh, what I've done up here. This is my. Where did you go? Oh, there you are. All right. So I want to um, actually go. All right, let's do this. Whoops, I want to go that way. All right, there we go. Come on, go, go. There it is. And whoops, keep going the wrong way. One of these days, I can remember which way that button goes. Now, so this is an old resistor that I had. This is a 27k. I think this is supposed to be 28k. <clears throat> That's well within range. Um, this one was supposed to be 500k, and the, the resistor that was in there was 900k, so a little bit out. I snuck another one under here. This is one meg, and this one was one of, uh, it's one of these, and it was 2.5 megs. It's supposed to be one meg. This one actually is a 500k that's 540, which is within range. Um, this is a capacitor, and I stuck this in here to replace that because um, I don't trust these. Um, now, when I got the radio, there's a resistor that went from here, I think it up, up to here, yes. And then there was another one that went from here over to here. This is, this goes to the screen grid of uh, the detector tube, I think. One of the 24s. So what had happened in this resi this resistor under here, this, I think it's 1.5 meg, this resistor had gone open circuit. And by the way, trying to get resistors underneath this board I've got this one underneath this board. Actually, this is the 1.5 meg that I stuck underneath. I was able to get at it from under here. Trying to do anything in this area from underneath, forget it. Trying to get this resistor out was fun. Uh, to say nothing of trying to get a resistor back in there. The only thing I would have been able to do is, is take the, the, the rivets out, flop this down, and then replace the components, and then come up with some kind of rivet or bolt it back together whatever I'd have to do. I may, I, well, who knows. Um, hiding under here, so there's a resistor here, here, and here. This one actually was in, within spec. Underneath uh, this one and this one, are there are two capacitors, microfarad, um, micro microfarad, or, or uh, uh, oh man, my brain. Picofarad, that's the word I couldn't think of. There's a couple of picofarad caps hiding under here. Um, those are an interesting design. They're put together. There's a couple of plates, four, five, six plates, that are pressed together with um, insulation and dielectric, or, and then conductor in between. Pretty wild, and, but they're just pressed together. So I, I haven't checked the values on these. I'm just going to see how the radio plays. And we'll go from there. Um, so anyway, so that was that. Oh yeah. So back to where I was. I, I wanted this. This right here is, in fact, this one and this one. These are both filament lines right here. 
One resistor went from here to here. This is AC volts. You really don't want to put AC volts on your screen grid. That's a DC voltage. Then they did this. This is a coil. This goes to the plate of that same tube that this, this lead goes to. So I think this was uh, the screen grid and this is the plate. I believe this is the plate. So they had another resistor that went from here up to here. And I think the plate voltage is, oh, I don't know, 57 volts, 67 volts, something like that on that tube. The other tubes are 173, I believe. So, so when I got the radio, this had a, radio, a resistor that was stuck in there that didn't belong. And there's another one that went in here that also didn't belong. And so I was kind of puzzled, what on earth what were they trying to do? Well, then I found out that this resistor that went from here to here was open circuit. I said, aha, uh -huh, I know what you're trying to do. So... Uh, So I removed those two resistors and um, basically said, you know, if it didn't work, I'd have to troubleshoot further, but I was pretty confident. Definitely this one going from here to that screen was a bad idea. Um, there was a five, I think it was five mag that went from here to here, I, I forget, or was it one mag? doesn't matter. This was a fairly high ohm resistor, but Again, the real issue was that this resistor was open, that, that hides underneath here, that 1.5, and that went, I'm pretty sure that's to the, uh, that's to the, yes, the screen grid. So, yeah, not a good idea. So we're about to find out um, we're about to find out uh, if all of this is going to work properly. Um, I had all the cans put on back on the radio because I worried about working above it, but then I realized that I couldn't get up in there to get at this resistor with the can on there. And I haven't stuck the can back on, but I'm pretty much done working on it, I'm hoping anyway. So here we go, uh, we're going to... Um, we are going to, so down here, what I've got, this is plate voltage, this one goes to that, and then this one is grid voltage. Um, remember I said I wanted to check the grid voltage uh, to make sure all is well because I don't trust that coupling cap. So I want to make sure that this is okay. Now, actually, let me, I want to check something out because, because, because I'm getting, and again, this is the old, which do one, which one do I believe? Um, I want to look up the, the suggested grid voltage for the 45.2. So, um, grid volts, minus 56. Hmm. And does this have, does this have, uh, da, 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 730. Now they're saying that the Cathode bias resistor is supposed to be 1500 ohms. But I'm looking at this is 730. This is a center tap 55 ohm, and so, you know, 27 ohms. So we're talking maybe 800 ohms uh, here. So the, the, bi the biased resistor, bias resistor is lower than. What they suggest. Um, what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to. This says that the the voltage 
on the grid of the 45 tube should be minus 56 volts. Um, Well, we'll see what we get, because um, I don't know. What I am going to do, if, if I don't like the numbers on those tubes on the grids, what I am going to do is I'm going to pop uh, this wire right here off, and then I'll just scab in a uh, healthy capacitor, new capacitor, and I'm going to see what that does for the voltage here. Because I really, if this is supposed to be 50, negative 56 volts now, oh well, here's the part that's confusing. The tube manual says this should be 56 volts. I believe this is something negative 56 volts. I think this says 37 volts. And I, that, that just doesn't seem right. So anyway, so we're going to turn this on. We're going to see what we see. Um, I do have over here my bulbs. And I have, uh, ew. I, have, I have these two bulbs turned on. The bypass is on. So I think we're ready. So we're going to turn this up. Um, I think we got to turn this on first, I guess it helps. Alright, so we're going to see, and over here, um, i got to get the voltage up to around 40 volts, and then it will turn on. And there it is, around 38 volts it turns on. Oh, turn these guys on. Uh, yes, yes. Alright. So, that's telling me I've got 38 volts, which obviously won't do anything and keep on going. One of my bulbs is glowing, uh, which you can't see very well because it's off screen. There we go. Um, I rearranged everything, so unfortunately my monitor's in the background. But, all right, so that's saying 61 volts. That bulb is glowing a little bit. 145 here, zero there. Um, Let's keep going. So we should be, because the plate voltage on these guys is up where it belongs, we should be doing something on the amp. Um, let's go here. And we got some glowing there. These two bulbs are glowing. And, well, this says I've got 79 volts. Let's bring it up a little bit more. That's 83. Oh. got we've got noise it's working um, what I'm going to do is back this off a little bit I'm going to bypass so we go to full voltage and now we should have So that's not so good. Let's 
what I just did was turn the, vo the, the voltage down. So, the minute I turn the volume down, it disappears. So, my volume control is not working very well. And that is not going to be nice. Because that... <laughs> Oy! Well... But, we've made progress. Let's see how this is doing here. Not even hot. It's a little bit warm. Not warm at all. These are two watt resistors I bought or put in here. Because I wasn't sure. Uh, right now, because it's hot, I dare not. There's certain things I don't dare touch. But um, so it's working. But um, and it's not humming. To bring this up, there's no hum, um, which that's pretty amazing. But I am worried about this because if it's supposed to be negative 50 volts and it's not negative. Um, that could be bad for the output tubes. So, um, so I'm going to substitute a, a capacitor in here temporarily. See what's what. Um, see if it makes any difference as far as the uh, as far as the voltage on the grid of these tubes. But um, it's receiving. It's receiving signal. It's actually, uh, and it sounds like it could have some pretty decent volume. Of course, I've got I've got this on here, which muffles the speaker quite a bit. But even with the cover on there, it was pretty loud. But I definitely. So what's it going to have to do? I'm going to have to show you. This is not. This is not going to be fun. Um, let me see if I can scoot in there and show you what's what. Um, yeah. All right, this is, whoops, there. Let's go there. This is my volume control right here, this little big light case right there. It's, it's riveted here, threw it on the back. It's got three connectors here and three connections here. And it's the same type of connection as the rest of the stuff is in this radio. So you have to heat it up. Sometimes you get lucky and pull the wire out, but if not, then you have to split, you know, separate this folded over part. You have to unfold it a little bit so you can pull the wire out. And, uh, and I'm hoping, because you got wires here, whoops, I got in the way. There's wire, big heavy wires here that are probably going to be in my way. I try to take this out. Fun. Or maybe I can tilt it. I don't know. We'll see. So that's what I'm going to be dealing with next, it looks like. Um, but yay, it actually plays. Um, there, was, there, was, there was so many questions when I was starting to play with this and work on it. Uh, you know, for starters, I wasn't entirely thrilled with, or, yeah, thrilled talk. These guys, the documentation misled me a little bit, so I almost, I got some of those wired up wrong. Apparently, I fixed it correctly because the radio seems to be working quite well. Um, technically, when you hook up an antenna to one of these, you should also hook up a ground to the ground. I didn't do that, so there's a chance that this would pick up even better if I were to do that. But I just wanted to see if it, would actually gonna, if it was actually going to work. So, um, yeah, it's, everything's probably cooled off by now. Um, so there's, um, yeah, that's not, yeah, I'm reluctant to reach around and, and try to check 
temperatures on things because, well, you get that pretty easily. Very small capacitors, they um, aren't going to hold the charge the way that um, electrolytics, big electrolytics do. But uh, I'm still of two minds. Well, here's well, let me back up to, I'm corralling my thoughts, I'm pulling my thoughts back in so I can make sense. Here's some of the, my concerns, but number one, I was going to, I think it's on one side, one leg or the other, or one leg or the other of this, I think. This is replacing that high ohm coil choke. So I was going to replace one of the, the, these capacitors with a 22 mega, mega microfarad electro, electrolytic, which would mean that this would have to be mounted outside of this box. I don't want it in the box because electrolytics go bad, and I don't want some poor schmuck would have to come along in the future if it went south, unsolder all of this, undo the all the tabs, take this apart and replace that electrolytic. I wouldn't want to do that. So, on the other hand, if I were to take this apart and gut it, I could <coughs> leave this terminal disconnected from anything inside the box and just hook up an electrolytic on the outside. Basically use this as a terminal strip. I'm going to try to find a 6K ohm uh, resistor that I could just mount as a single resistor, so it's not quite so floppy. Um, but here's the thing that drives me crazy, or that's just shocking to me, and making me do second guess myself. If putting a new capacitor in here doesn't um, make a difference, well, I don't know. I do not, I do not, absolutely do not want to put or leave an old capacitor in a, in a coupling cap position. I don't want, I don't like leaving coupling caps in because they can toast the tube. And especially with these tubes, these are expensive to buy now. It's like there's no, there's absolutely zero, this thing is dead quiet, I mean silent, if you turn the volume down. Now I don't know if once I get the volume control working correctly if that's if that's going to be true or not. Uh, at low volume maybe I will hear humming. So this has got to be dealt with. I need to jump in a new capacitor here to see how that behaves and what I get for voltages. So I will be back when I've dealt with both of those because obviously the control is, is a big issue. And usually these are wire wound. And if that's not healthy, that's bad. You see, does it tell me, it's got to tell me what the uh, control is for resistance. Uh, I think it's got to tell me somewhere. Well, R3, it says it's a 1K ohm. Um, does it say what the other... They are two different... They are listed differently, and I can't really make that out. R1? 50K ohms. R2? So it looks like it looks like they're ordering them kind of in, in order. So this would be R1. There's an R2 here and then R3. But anyway, I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure this is R1. And it definitely looks like this is R3. R5. Okay, so that's yeah, I think this is right. I enlarged this one. And I probably should try to enlarge this one. Um, on, on this end. See if I can figure out what's going on. But all right, so I'm wasting a lot of time uh, 
But so one of these is 1k ohm and one of them is 50k ohms. So, um, yeah, I'm finding something like that that's going to be difficult. I got to find out what's going on inside that, inside that, inside of that uh, volume control. I have a feeling I won't like what I find, but but it is what it is. So, all right. Well, I shall return after I've found out what I needed to find out because that's a little bit disappointing. A friend of mine had one of these well, a number of years ago, but he did very little. I think he just cleaned up a few controls and uh, and the thing worked. I, on the other hand, well, I had troubles. So, all right, I shall return. All right, well, I took this apart. Um, I did have to drill the rivets out on both sides. There was just no way to get to where I wanted to get to. So I'll be using screws to put it back together. Now, what I've done is I took, using a combination of things, contact cleaner, air, canned air, um, and Q-tips. How these are designed is this is your center this is connected to the center pin of your uh, control and when you push down on it it makes contact with the resistance material which goes all the way around from this side to this side of course as you push down and then move along this move along this you change the resistance because of you're contacting the resistance material in a different spot as you go along and I'm not sure and so the other thing that's and I need to clean this up a bit um, so what they do is they use this is a piece of little piece of wood right here and uh, I may have to. I may have to see if I can come up with some a very tiny bit of lubrication, but we'll see. Because I really don't want any grease migrating into the resistance material. So what happens is when you notice I, I took some of that green stuff off from there. Well, this isn't the only place that stuff shows up. It also shows up on the underside of of this part right here so that as the uh, control is traveling around it, the this metal piece contacts corrosion rather than uh, rather than resistance material and so you have a wind up you wind, yeah, you wind up with a break in your control all right so let's see what we've got here so now i've got this all right It seems like it's working better. Um, hmm. I'm kind of surprised because that so far all I've done, all I did with this, was uh, <clears throat> the control is turning very stiffly. So I gave a shot of contact cleaner into the stem, figuring it's probably grease that had been all gunked up in there, and then. Uh, Yeah. Now I guess I'm not gonna play with that. And then I gave a quick shot in here, mostly in the area where the shaft would ride, and basically just trying to eliminate any grease. And it did. It really that has made a huge difference. Well, this is a 90-year-old radio, uh, so I guess. Problems are expected to arise, although with my uh, Atwater Kent, I did not have these. Well, 
Where do I want to start? Well, let me start with this definitely dead control. And let me show you why I say that. Let's see, we're going to put this over here so we can see that. And we're going to straighten out there. They're crooked. All right. Let's see. We're going to go there. Um, I was reluctant to clean this. But the way this wor was working was when you would crank the control all the way up, then you would get volume. And the reason you would get volume is that the connection between here and here would go to zero or near zero. In fact, let's see what it is. In fact, let's grab. So I have to keep playing around. So we've got you, we've got you. And we're just going to see what that is. Well, fine. I'm anal. I wanted to be the right color. I don't know. It's strange. Okay. Well, this is still too high. That's K ohms. Hard to tell probably in the camera, but 8K. And you go from there. Yeah. 99K. I saw 107. 150. Oof. All right. This one is the side that ha that takes care of the antenna. Let's find out what the other side is. Uh, okay, it's going to be like that, and it's going to be over here, I guess. All right. Now. Um, Alright, 120 ohms, that might work, but the minute I move my thumb away from here, it drums up way too high. Yeah. This, this is supposed to be 1K ohm. And I wasn't entirely sure because the print on the schematic is less than clear. But uh, it does appear, well, it, this is a 1.4K ohm. And with this connected, this works pretty well. Uh, so the fact that this is, well, it's here. 4.6K, 5K. Let's just see what it is overall. Ah! Oh, 71K and bouncing around. So, basically what's happened is that this, this uh, resistance material has failed. Uh, and, of course, it did not help when I cleaned it. I, I knew that was a risk, but this was unusable as it was. So let me just, uh, yeah, I'm I'm putting my probe where this is going to actually contact. Yeah, that's just that's just beyond gone. Um, I haven't looked for what my options are in terms of replacing this. Um, I was experimenting. I left. I left this part of the volume control wired in, and then I wired in this control for the second part of the volume control. So this side has does does the antenna, and this side is actually uh, well, this one actually controls the bias for the cathode. Now I was a little bit puzzled when I was testing this because. Rotating this didn't matter. It didn't seem to affect things at all. That leads me to 
the next headache. <laughs> Let me just uh, slide this over a little bit and we'll take a little swoop in there, maybe. All right. Okay, so I tuck this out of the way. This is the wire that's supposed to go over here to the antenna. There's an, there's an antenna connection over there. And if you look at the schematic, you'll notice that. Let's see if I can get on there close enough. Focus, please. All right. The antenna goes straight to that control. There's no detours, there's no shortcuts, there's no nothing. It's supposed to go straight from the antenna to that, which is that black wire that uh, I just pointed to. And when I, like I said, was rotating this control, well, there were two things, two, two things that I was wondering about. Number one is this stopped receiving our local our local radio station, and I was wondering why. And when I pulled out my little AM transmitter, I got this to at least receive from the transmitter, but I was still puzzled as to why as to why reception changed and. I was kind of wondering if this was the issue. So what's happened here is that when I soldered this wire, I had to shove this back in to get everything to fit. This wire broke somewhere. Um, not exactly sure. I think it may have broken back here where it goes into this, uh, into this wire loom which is there. So when I realized that well, after I cleaned this and put this all back together, I had full volume only. And, like I said, I didn't have my local radio station anymore. So, I then pulled all the wires, left this in the radio, pulled all the wires off from this, hooked this up, and, of course, I found out that this indeed with with a, a control that was more in line with the values that's supposed to be, it did work. The uh, so I, I was debating about what to do next, and I'll, I'll show you in a minute what I, what I think I'm going to do. Um, so. caused me to think about doing this, but when I finally got this control out, because that this this wire is soldered on the back pin, and when you put it into the radio, that pin is facing toward the rear practically, aimed at the chassis, which makes it a little tough to get in there. And that when I was trying to get this wire to go where I wanted it to, apparently corrosion had gotten into this wire, and it looks fine out here, but out here, well, on the end, on the end that I cut off, it was definitely not looking great there. I still don't know why that wire broke, but I decided I was going to try to find out if, because I was trying to figure out, okay, there's got to be something, there's got to be some reason why this stopped receiving properly. So I went down, down here to the connection for the uh, antenna, looked on my clip lead, came up here. Is still attached to the control. Nothing, absolutely nothing. So I started moving, wiggling the wire around in my, I had my head on noisemaker, and that kept beeping on and off as I would move the wire. And so I said, "Great," and I, I just, I couldn't believe that that wire, that wire, um, broke. So I went back, reviewed the schematic, looked around. There is no other black wire, and this, this. This is the way it's supposed to be, because the other side of this control goes to there's a ground lug that there's a ground lug that sticks up here, and this side was grounded through that, and there are other wires that, that grounded there as well. 
So I was pretty confident that I knew what went where and there really was no no uh, no way around it. And the other thing this was start this was crackling and making noise and it wasn't doing that before either. So I'm thinking that this was making and breaking connections because I didn't have this nut here tightened. So as I would move the control it would jiggle that wire a little bit and I think it was uh, making noise. So I ran a new black wire. So again, so my, the question is what do I do with this? Uh, I have heard that there's a guy who can make these controls. I'm sure that won't be cheap. But here's what I want to do. I'm going to try it. Let's back out here. Now, this may or may not be possible. I just don't know. Um, i got to get that out of the way so I can see what I'm doing. All right. This... I don't need you. This is a dual control. And <laughs> it's kind of interesting. When I was checking the, this control, I thought that I'd found the most amazing combination that one side was 48k and the other side was 1k ohm. Well, no. It's not, it's not like that. What it turned out to be was that the, the inside of this, this control was full of crud. I mean, it felt like gravel was in there. So, so one side was giving me a lower resistance, and I discovered that because then I started moving the control around, and I, for that I was using my Beckman, which responds a lot faster to changes in resistance. Still not like a, an analog meter, but it works fairly well. And I was noticing that it was dancing around. I thought, oh, okay. So I took it apart. And it's kind of a nice setup they've got here because you've got these are the two contact plates. This goes together like that. And of course, you have to make sure that you put it together right. Uh, because if you don't, well, one control will be 180 degrees out, and you've got your stop lugs that would pretty much prevent you from going very far because this would be in the wrong place. But anyway, so so that's kind of nice. So here's my thought. Unfortunately, all manufacturers' parts are not interchangeable. So I don't know if I, when I pull this apart if this is going to be usable. If it is, I'm going to take one of these and put it in the front half of the control, where this one is now. I can take this part out of this and put it in the second half. And this is this is 1.4. It's supposed to be a 1K, but it seems to work okay. It seems to work fine. And so I'm going to investigate this. Uh, I didn't do that yet. Uh, obviously, this is still together. But I'm going to investigate this. If it works, I'm going to try to see if I can figure out how I can wire this everything up. Uh, with this, because it's going to be quite different, and I'm going to have to do some fudging, playing around. And I found out that this 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 part, the ground, fits on here okay. And I think I may not even have to. Well, actually, I will. I'll just have to bend that finger out of the way or something. But. Um, but this pin here goes into a hole in, in the uh, the chassis. So, so anyway, so I'm going to put this together. I'm going to assemble this on the radio. Uh, if, if this part will work, and we'll see. Okay. Well, as you can see. I have my control in here. Here's the 1K part that I cobbled into there. They are not a good match, but I made it work. And there's the front half. It's 50K. Uh, have you tried ever to uh, search for volume controls, linear or nonlinear, whatever, that are half and half? 
Yeah. Somebody's gonna. I'm gonna have to find somebody who can. I think there is a guy who does that who can make custom. My only other option would be to find a pot that's got the right stem length. And it's made by the same company and has the same parts where I could interchange them. But um, I miss the days of when you could go to a place, an electronic shop uh, supplier, I should say, and um, you could actually look at stuff before you bought it and you could see things like this pot and that pot are made by the same company. They look pretty much identical. We should be able to use those too, and uh, oh, we got something loose somewhere. I don't know what. I don't. Know. Um, I had trouble with this tube up here making racket uh, up there, and uh, it was um, working a lot better after I cleaned the socket and stuff. But I don't know. Maybe there's something still loose. I don't think there's anything that's not been soldered properly. And I try to make very sure of that these days. But anyway, so back to this. All right. By the time I got done copying this together, that um, that resistive part of the pot went from 1400k of 1.4k to 1.7. I was thinking 1.4 could be acceptable. 1.7 I knew was probably not great. So what I did was I took this uh, 2.7k ohm resistor and jumped it across the, the the two end contacts of the or connectors of the, the pot. And when I read it when I read across the pot now, it is about a 1k ohm resistor, and it does work. Uh, this is a comedy routine, so I don't know if it's copyrighted, but we'll just... That sudden boost of volume, that is not me doing it. You get to a certain point, and this is what I was hoping to solve with this. You get to a certain point, and all of a sudden it, the, vo the, the volume boosts way high. So, I mean, this is this is working well enough. This is working well enough so I can continue working on this radio and getting everything else finished up and making sure everything else is working. Uh, I have uh, not that much left to do. The speaker, I think, might there might be some issues still with that. Um, I have to play around with that and see where where that stands, but. Um, yeah, uh, unfortunately, and I'm, I'm kind of dismayed that the volume control in this has gone south. My Atwater Kent, that control still works since it's about the same vintage as this one. Of course, there's a possibility that Atwater Kent uses wire wound rather than this style, rather than this style uh, of uh, control. Um, I'm assuming they, they designed them like this because it was either wire wrapped or something like this because the material they used was not very rugged. And I was very, I tried to be gentle, very careful and very gentle when I was cleaning this. And well, the controls was not usable before I touched it. And sadly, my cleaning efforts made it worse unfortunately. So, yeah. Gave it a shot, but it didn't work. So, uh, I'm probably just going to take this off from here so that when I'm working on it, I can flip this down and I can hopefully try to track down my noisemaker. Uh, it's possible... That it could... Wow. I think I have a loose connection somewhere, maybe in... Maybe in the, uh, oh, interesting. Uh, well, we're going to have to find out where that's coming from. 
Uh, maybe I'll we'll just clean all of the sockets above there and uh, see if I can get rid of it that way. So at this point, um, yeah, I need another bulb. Anyway, this is just a little flashlight bulb that I had kicking around. Um, and uh, I hooked it on there just to, be, to be, just to remind me. This thing is so quiet. So yeah, I got to investigate that. I think there's a guy who makes custom volume controls. And uh, oh, this is the other thing I did want to mention. This is touchy. I think in part because of the design of the circuit that it is uh, is in. Because they're, they're using this to mod modulate or, or regulate or change the, uh, the bias of the grid, I believe. Or not the grid, the cathode. The cathode bias is being adjusted by that. And it's very touchy, very sensitive to changes in resistance. Um, one person that I, I, I read it uh, for, uh, in a forum, boy, yeah, anyway, I read in the forum about one guy who had a control made for his radio, similar in idea to mine, not the same controls, and he said that the guy who made it for him recommended using a linear taper, not an audio taper, and I can see why he would want to do that. That's probably an audio taper control in there. You don't want sudden changes in your resistance when you're dealing with this type of circuit. At least, uh, but as far as I can see, that's not the best idea. So, uh, yes, and so the person who had that pot made with a linear taper said he was much happy with how it performed. So if I can get the same thing done for this, hopefully not costing me a small fortune, um, then not only will I have a, a working control, it's probably going to work better than it did when it was new. Um, I'm trying to think what else is going on at this point other than my noisemaker, which means I have to drop this down, start poking around, see if I can figure out what's going on, because I don't think, so I go, if I go, down here, I think I've already nothing. I'm trying to not be careless here. Okay, nothing, 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 nothing. Yeah, I think we got a loose loose tube socket. So, anyway, so that's that's uh, where I'm at with this. I and mean, for now, that will let me use this. Before, you basically couldn't. Uh, you either had full volume or none, which was because that control had degraded and the resistance material had gone high resistance, much higher than it was supposed to be. Uh, and, and like I said, well, my cleaning efforts, well, yeah, not so good. But I really didn't have anything to lose because, well, the control was indeed in trouble and I think I amber along on long enough for this point. Uh, oh, I finally got smart. That's the other thing. I, I just want to mention this. If you're working on one of these, put this in front of the board. This is the needle that goes in the, the uh, tuning thing. And I was hitting this thing constantly and I was so afraid of breaking it. Then I looked at it more closely and I thought, you know what? It looks like this could slide out. And I tried it and it sure did. So if you're working on one of these, you want to avoid breaking your pointer, just remove it. And uh, set it aside until you're ready to put it back together. And, and this, um, oh, let me just mention one other thing. Oh no, I'm going to save that for later. <laughs> 